Hello again, my friends. Uh, I got another book review for you called Blueprint, The Evolution, Evolutionary Origins of a Good Society by Nicholas A. Christakis. He's a physician and a sociologist. He runs the, I believe it's called the Good Nature, the Human Nature Lab at Yale University. So he does a lot of science, very like scientific uh, studies on humans and interaction and sociological um, studies. And so it was, uh, <laughs> I got to be honest right up front, it was a bit of a tough one to get through because it is so scientific and he leaves like no stone unturned. <laughs> Which, um, so if you're, you know, if you're super into like, you know, the study of human beings and their like social sociology, the social interactions, the uh, a variety of different societies and how they were set up accidental societies such as shipwrecks and intentional societies such as communes and like like everything he goes through everything and so you know after a while I was sort of like whoo like this is a little too much on every little detail you know um, but having said that I did pull out some very intriguing things um, he goes, he, he relates, you know, humans to other species and different animals and like how they've developed their brain or their interactions with one another and why, why is that so similar to humans and why did we both kind of evolve to have that trait and some very cool things. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people out there are really digging this book, but um, for me, I'm more, I, I tend to lean more on the like, you know, um, kind of emotional connection to another human, and so it it was insightful, but but uh, maybe too much detail on the scientific side of, of a lot of things. But I'll um, I'll jump in real quick. Um, I just wanted to read some of the titles be to give you an idea of of some of the things that the chapter headings of what he's talking about. But like. The society within us, un unintentional communities, intentional communities, artificial communities, first comes love, animal attraction, animal friends, friends and networks, one way to be social, remote control, genes, culture, and natural social laws. And within every chapter, he has multiple headings uh, or sections that break down a variety of things. So like on the unintentional communities, he literally goes through like a dozen un unintentional communities that were uh, mostly shipwrecks or societies that had uh, ended up on an island or something with a group of you know a small group usually goes through some communes or some interesting uh, stuff on those too so as my you know my usual I'll just read some a few of the highlighted portions that I have right um, throughout the book and he talks about what connects us to one another that there's a lot and Really, you know, you can't just pinpoint it, but he does say that death and grief unite us like nothing else. Those are the two kind of things that really draw people together more than anything. Um, all people find meaning in the world, love, love their families, and enjoy the company of friends. They teach one another things of value and work together in groups. In my view, recognizing this common humanity makes it possible for all of us to lead grander and more virtuous lives. Now, part of this book, a major part of this, is trying to sort of identify what is genetic and what is sort of cultural influence or, uh, or I guess, outside influence, right? Nature. Um, and that's a, that's a lot of his work, like genetics. And so the reason I bought this book, honestly, was because I heard him uh, in an interview with Joe Rogan. It was very fascinating because they were having, a, you know, a bit of a dialogue, and this guy's just full of... Of amazing cool information um, so when you get to ask questions about some of these things that you know you can imagine a very interesting conversation um, they did studies as I said around the world every different type of society every group and they found a lot of very similar uh, things between us right and he says in the book many times that we are much more alike than we are different but like what things are genetically in our DNA that cause us to be that way. Um, so in one study, this is kind of interesting, interesting, he said one of our more more dispiriting phenomena that we have observed is in is 
the in-group favoritism mentioned above. So we tend to we tend to identify people as like people we should uh, we should identify with and associate with, and people we shouldn't. Right, and um, this happens early on. So he says. In one experiment, five-year-old children were given t-shirts of different colors, red, blue, green, orange, and then shown pictures of other children wearing t-shirts of the same or different color as their own. The children understood that their shirt colors were randomly assigned and there was indeed no specific difference among the children in the photographs other than their shirt colors. Still, the children preferred the kids wearing the same t-shirt color. They allocated more of the scarce resources, toys, coins, etc. to them and they reported more positive thoughts about them. They also felt that the kids in the shirt color group would be more likely to be kind and share toys. It goes on and on. But just the amount of difference that they, like superiority almost, that they, they placed on children that had similar shirt colors to them was dramatic and that doesn't really go away. <laughs> in a lot of ways we continue to, to have those same habits and. Um, and interactions. He says in one experiment three month old babies were shown a blue square helping a red circle up a hill and a yellow triangle pushing the circle down. The babies reliably chose the blue square when given a choice. Um, this happens super young. We decide um, who is good and who's not, who's with us and who's against us kind of thing and um, plays a major factor in our lives forever. He says, let's see, when some scientists describe the evolutionary basis of, of behavior, whether at, at the individual or societal level, they often focus on the differences between humans that can divide and even fracture us. But when I speak of a blueprint, my interest here is in is altogether different. I'm not saying that differences across societies are based on our genes. Rather, I'm saying that the similarities across societies instant, uh, uh, instantiated in the social suite are based on our genes. He calls the social suite sort of this, um, these commonalities that, that exist that um, help us cooperate and, and function and like sort of our in, in, innate built-in genetic coding that drives these things. Um, here's a leadership one for you because that's kind of my thing, right? Leadership along with mild heart hierarchy often played a decisive role in the successful operation and endurance of the communes. So this is in a section where he went through multiple communes in different countries, but mostly in America because um, for a time there it was like, I mean it still is, this is a kind of the country where you're able to sort of freely create the societies you want uh, within, you know, within a certain scope and, and um, in the early or mid 90s I guess that there was a lot of that right people sort of creating these communes of 20 or 100 people and they, they would they had different rules set up different rules on how you know resources would be allocated or uh, how everyone would have to contribute or whatever um, these people that joined the communes tended to be a little bit more sensitive towards like feelings of um, like a lack of purpose and meaning in life and so then they would join these communes and sort of get that for a, a while. Um, oddly enough a lot of the communes didn't um, didn't have traditional families and, and, and for a variety of reasons didn't actually reproduce their own you know children and so therefore they had to recruit um, which in anyway you'll have to get into it if you want to look at it. Um, another explanation, oh, so, okay, <laughs> this is a little bit of uh, some of the differences between men and women and a lot of these things I'm literally jumping in the middle of these like very detailed scientific like studies or stories and so it might not make tons of sense but he says another explanation is that women do actually benefit from their husbands provisioning when they are at their most vulnerable, namely when they are pregnant or have very young children. In generational Hadza men spent 5.7 hours per day foraging and women spent 4.2 hours. On average, women bring more calories overall back to the camp than men, 57% versus 43% of the total. But when a woman is pregnant or nursing, her husband appears to up his game and the balance shifts. Um, <laughs> by by uh, Marlowe demonstrated that 
among couples with children under one year of age, men provide 69% of the calories consumed by the family. Um, later he says, it's clear that even in an exceptionally egalitarian environment, nuclear families are a persistent feature that couples have strong preferences for each other and for their own children. Um, there's quite a bit of detail in, on those topics in these sections with um, why, you know, why humans, so, so certain species will like kill babies or, or whatever and, and kill each other just to have a chance to mate, right? Um, and obviously humans have, have an issue with, you know, monogamy at times or, or polygamy at times, it's just sort of, it, it, has, it has gone back and forth multiple times throughout history. Um, and but for monogamous societies, the violence seems to be lower because um, everyone sort of gets a fair shot at having a, a mate and having sex and all this stuff, right? Um, in societies where there's more like polygamy, it typically shifts a bunch of the, you know, relationships and things to a certain percentage of people and then there's a large percentage of people that don't get that um, opportunity or advantage, so then they're out causing problems, fighting and stealing and doing different things, right? But also, um, you know, men, human men, have a particular interest in, in being a part of their children's lives. And that gives us a sort of a purpose and a meaning. Um, so it's both men and women, but um, typically it's men that cause most of the problems when they don't have a mate or children. Um, so broad and powerful is the impact of genes on behavior that in a 2000 uh, psychological psychologist Eric Turkenheimer formulated this first law of behavioral genetics. All humans' behavioral traits are inheritable, are heritable. One extraordinary study combined data from 2,700 publications involving over 17,000 human traits. Uh, oh, over 14 million twin pairs and 17 thousand human traits. It concluded that virtually every behavioral domain had genetic determinants. Roughly speaking, genes and environment are equally important in determining the ex extent to which people manifest numerous traits from re religiosity to risk aversion. So interesting. It's just, it's just crazy. So a lot of times people have, an, you know, they argue like nature versus nurture and some people get really passionate about it, right? Thinking that if, if they just if parents were different, that their kids would have turned out super good, or you could take um, someone, you know, that anyway, you could dramatically change people's lives, and that's that's true. But there's also traits that manifest because of genetics, and so he says that they're basically equal. So if you have, you know, certain genetics and nurturing environment for that trait, it's going to flourish phenomenally, right? And uh, if you only have one or the other, then maybe it'll be diverted some, but um, they're, they seem to be about equally important as far as manifesting a trait, a characteristic. Um, universal bias. Humans are often frame the natural world in terms of dualities. So it's like black and white, us, them, right? And apparently this concept is one that uh, has actually allowed us to create these bonds and social um, connections, friends and family versus those who are not, uh, which seems to be a core unit in human societies across the world, that, that when we have these units of like the core family, uh, we do much better because we get to learn from our elders, we get to teach, teach our younger, we get to protect each other, we can feed each other. In that Hadza community that I mentioned a minute ago, the whole community, they live in small communities and everyone brings food in and everyone gets to eat it. And, you know, so one explanation of this is that it's like you're, if you have a bad day of hunting or foraging, uh, you still get to eat because other people were successful. And that, that sort of protects us from the downside, right? So uh, that's just a small example of how that can re relate to all um, different aspects of our lives. The bigger story here is that we are friendly and kind and we have a, uh, 
psychology shaped by natural selection to, buy, to be this way. These features of the social suite work together. They set the stage for us to cooperate with others and to teach and learn from others. We have not evolved simply to live in undifferentiated groups like herds of cattle. We have evolved to live in networks in which we have specific connections to other individuals whom we come to know, love, and like, which is a, in itself a, a unique characteristic for um, any animal species is to like differentiate between like different, you know, different people and levels of relationship and how much we trust someone or like someone or uh, even love them. Um, I didn't, I didn't actually catch any of the highlighted parts of like the animals, but he, he had some really cool stuff on like elephants or whales or dolphins and, and chimpanzees and things and just some of those behaviors that they have and like the emotion they tend to feel and things like that. Um, one woman lived with the elephants for like years uh, studying studying elephants and then she left for two years. She brought her, her mother and children back to see where she had worked all this time and these elephants like went nuts when they recognized her scent and that she was there and they just, just went crazy and had like tears and uh, you know all the emotion that in, in ways that elephants show that emotion and that they do that for one another as well and um, they actually will support each other like if one's sick they've been known to like help sort of walk alongside or even prop up a sick elephant they protect each other they um, will mourn mourn grave sites and things like that so they developed all these very interestingly like what we would call human traits and why is it that you know humans developed that at the same time that elephants did and dolphins and same with other species right um, so a very detailed interesting book it is long it's over 400 pages of just packed information so uh, it's um, it's a bit of a read but um, if you're into the sociology and you're kind of interested in genes versus nature uh, this is your book to read so um, I'll of course throw the link in there and I'll throw it on the website rank it in my on my best self-help books list and uh, anyway hope you guys enjoyed it and we'll, we'll catch you next time hey guys thanks for watching as always I love to hear your comments so please comment below uh, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell so you'll get notified when new videos come up so you can stay engaged with the conversation and stay motivated for additional resources and information go to bronsonwilkes.com